sometimes I get asked if I'm on the warpath to go through all the alleged viruses one by one and show that they don't exist. While it sounds like fun, I'm not sure that it is required because the familiar pattern starts to appear in virology with regards to lack of valid control experiments, failure to demonstrate the full characteristics of the alleged particles and the complete failure to show that they can cause disease. Someone who has been calling out the questionable evidence regarding the existence of pathogenic viruses for much longer than me is German microbiologist Dr. Stefan Lenker. Dr. Lenker hit the headlines in 2015 when the corporate media smeared him by reporting that he had foolishly offered 100,000 euros to anyone that could prove the existence of the measles virus. How could anyone be so crazy, they alleged, and to this day, some of these sites continue to imply that Dr. Lanka was proven wrong and lost his money. But is that what really happened? Dr. Lanka is a major thorn in the side for parts of the medical establishment and pharmaceutical industry. He does the experiments that nobody else has been doing, especially control experiments in virology. He has shown that cytopathic effects, one of the ways virologists claim proof of a virus, can be generated in a test tube by simply stressing the cells through the technique itself. That is through the addition of substances such as antibiotics and passaging of the culture. However, to this day, these false proxies continue to be presented as evidence of viruses. Dr. Lanker has also pointed out the problems of shotgun and metagenomic sequencing techniques to create alleged genomes, particularly in virology. Stefan has his own exuberant style and discusses some of the issues related to this here. And the most important thing is to know, from the nucleic acid which they had in their hand, they could not create a genome. So they multiplied it with PCR in a such a dirty way with a lot of cycles and a lot of cycles always mean dirty. A lot of new sequences are produced which in reality are not there. And with this artificially produced uh, nucleic acid, with, even then they could not come up with a genome. So they took some sequences, made this assembly, ah, some of them fit here, some of them fit there. And uh, so then we put all those things to a given genome of a coronavirus. And even then the, the thing was not ready. And the second step, what they are doing, they are producing artificial short sequences of nucleic acid called primer used in the PCR and they construct in such a high number that the sequences artificially created on their own are 20% of the genome, right? And then only after this, what they are calling deep metagenomic sequencing, they come up with, with a genome. So to put it short, what they have in reality in their test tubes, right? They, are, they have nothing. In any case, it was in 2011 that Dr. Lenker was concerned about the basis of the measles vaccine and proposals to mandate the vaccine for children in Germany. He concluded that the best way to draw attention to the matter would be to get some public attention on the science as to whether the virus even existed in the first place and was the causative agent of the disease. So he offered a reward of 100,000 euros to anyone who could prove the existence and the size of the measles virus by means of a scientific publication. Believing that he had collated the required proof, physician David Barden submitted six publications, but as Dr. Langer had specified a single publication, he responded that the conditions of his offer had not been fulfilled. Dr. Barden then sued Lanka, and in March 2015, the Ravensburg Land Court, one of the lower courts in Germany, ruled that Lanka had to pay him the 100,000 euros plus interest. This, this was German biologist Stefan Lanka. I love the story. He offered 100,000 euro for proof that measles exist and a court made him pay. Now, Dr. Lanka knew that this was a likely outcome in the lower court which doesn't rely on expert witnesses, so he appealed against this ruling and put the case before the Stuttgart Higher Regional Court in February 2016, where he won. Dr. Bardens appealed against this ruling to the highest court in Germany, but the appeal was dismissed in December 2016, and Lang
Thanks to my friend Germ at Germ Warfare for putting together that video. Since that time, I have seen various attempts by the media to claim that Dr. Lanka only won the case on a technicality or semantic formulation rather than on scientific merit. I suspect this is because it is another embarrassment for the medical system and vaccinologists. So let's have a look at the papers that were presented in court and decide for ourselves whether there is any evidence that the measles virus exists. Paper number one is a paper that I've talked about previously. It's the 1954 paper by Enders and Peebles that resurrected virology and their ongoing problems concerning isolating any viruses from humans. In this experiment, samples from patients that had a clinical diagnosis of measles were added to tissue cultures and then cytopathic effects were observed. That is, the cells appeared diseased and some died. So why was this rejected as evidence? Enders didn't perform any control experiments and has been demonstrated by Lanka himself you can get the same effects without adding patient samples. Enders and Peebles did warn in their paper that additional observations however will be required before it can be confidently asserted that dermal epithelial cells are specifically attacked by these viruses and it must be borne in mind that cytopathic effects which superficially resemble those resulting from infection by the measles agents may possibly be induced by unknown factors. Unfortunately, the warnings were swept aside and virologists to this day continue to use this unscientific method. The second paper presented was Studies on Measles Virus in Monkey Kidney Tissue Cultures from 1958. However, this was simply another cell culture experiment with observed cytopathic effects, so like the first paper, it does not constitute any evidence of a virus existing. The third paper was Electron Microscopy of Measles Virus Replication, published in 1969. Well, this time, the authors obtained lots of pictures of particles inside cells and claimed they were measles viruses, but they provided no evidence that these particles were viruses and relied on arbitrary declarations. The particles themselves were not shown in any way to be infectious or disease causing. The fourth paper was the molecular length of measles virus RNA and the structural organization of measles nucleocapsids, published in 1984. In this experiment, the authors produced images of purified particles which they said were measles viruses. However, as you may have guessed, like the previous paper, how is it known that these are viruses and can cause disease? They can't make this determination because no clinical experiments were performed to show that the particles did anything to a potential host. The fifth paper was Structure, Transcription and Replication of Measles Virus, published in 1995. This was a consensus review in which the authors purport to describe the measles virus genome. However, this was based on detecting genetic fragments in test tubes and assembling them into a hypothetical model. It was not established that the computer-generated sequence exists in nature. All the sequences were even viral in origin. The last paper was Analysis of Morphology and Infectivity of Measles Virus Particles, published in 2007. This one is probably the funniest. The authors did a tissue culture by mixing an alleged measles virus sample with Vero cells, the abnormal monkey kidney cell line that produces locks of action in the test tube. And then they took electron micrographs and claimed that the particles that ranged in size by a factor of 20 were viruses. This seems a little odd for something that is supposed to make faithful replicants of itself. In any case, they provided no evidence that the particles were able to cause disease and even worse, performed no control experiment for what are known to be non-specific cell reactions in a test tube. In summary, I don't think Dr. Lanka won the case on just a technicality, as even altogether, the six papers do not show that a measles virus exists. At the court proceedings, Professor Andreas Podbielski, head of the Department of Medical Microbiology and Virology in Rotstock, suggested that taken all together, they could perhaps be considered to provide evidence of the measles virus. But then he contradicted himself by admitting that with regards to the six presented papers, none of the authors had conducted any controlled experiments following internationally defined rules and principles of good scientific practice. It's unclear to me how combining six unscientific papers would produce a scientific result. So this is a sorry state of affairs with regards to the existence of the measles virus. And if you are wondering whether there are better papers that could have been put forward, 
it seems unlikely. While there are tens of thousands of published papers purporting to relate to the measles virus, most of them simply assume that the virus exists. And judging by the way virologists are operating, I don't think many of them are likely to make any attempts to address the existence issue in the near future. However, despite Stefan Lenker exposing this in such a public way, soon afterwards the German parliament passed into law the Measles Protection Act to make injections mandatory for children and staff in kindergartens and schools, medical facilities and community facilities from March 2020. Follow the science, right? But if a virus doesn't cause measles, what does? Many diseases in the past were thought to be due to viruses or infectious agents. For example, pellagra was originally considered to be spread by a virus when it is actually caused by a deficiency in niacin, vitamin B3. Vitamin A deficiency has been implicated in the role of measles, especially in the treatment of the disease. But then because everyone is looking through the virus lens, conclusions are made to fit unproven claims, such as acute measles precipitates vitamin A deficiency by depleting vitamin A stores and increasing its utilization. So the pattern continues where we are told a virus causes a particular disease even though there is no evidential proof of the virus. And then we have these morbilliform rashes which look just like measles, but result from all sorts of things that are not viruses, we are told. In fact, they are the most common type of prescription drug rash that we see. Again, it raises the problems of what measles is if these are non-specific findings. Over time, deaths from diseases such as measles have fallen dramatically as standards of living have improved incredibly since the early 1900s. Despite claims that are widely touted, the introduction of measles vaccines cannot be said to have been the reason for these improvements. And deaths and injuries are what we are trying to prevent, not meaningless case numbers as promoted by disingenuous sites such as Wikipedia. While we do see clusters of measles cases in unvaccinated communities, these also happen to be people exposed to the same environmental conditions, which are often suboptimal. Why could nutritional deficiencies not be considered as a cause of this disease and also relate to the severity of cases? In any case, the unproven virus theory and subsequent vaccines have likely hindered our progress towards better understanding of health. And yes, they can make vaccines without a virus existing. As like the experiments we've seen, they just claim the proteins and genetic fragments they work with in the test tubes are the virus. As a last note, I thought I would mention that Stefan and myself are both influenced by the same group when we set down the path of investigating the existence of viruses, and that's the Perth group. The Australian TPG are a powerhouse team that have rattled the HIV establishment for several decades. Their website contains devastating analyses of the HIV theory, including material that the big pharma controlled medical journals won't publish. They have shown us the way to critique the methodologies of modern virologists, and many of us are standing on their shoulders now. If you want to delve into some of the heavier literature regarding the existence of HIV, make sure you check out their website. We also borrow from the work of the Perth Group and provide an analysis of HIV theory suitable for a general audience in virus mania.